Uh, I think the last time I talked with you, John, it was about consciousness and conscience in Henry James. Right. Very profound and difficult topics. So what do you want to today? Well, let's talk about James and culture. Culture. Okay. James, you know, was a culture vulture. Right. He loved the arts. He loved, um, um, of course, literature. He was ferociously literary. Uh, by the way, there's a little book by Claire Hughes here, James and the Art of Dress, which is an eye-opener because uh -huh. when you read novels, you don't notice what people are wearing. But James was an expert even on, on dress, you know. So uh, everybody's clothing is meticulously described in, and it would fit in with the fashion of the times? Is that Absolutely. What, is that what they... For example, the bowler hat. Mm. James notes the importance of the bowler hat when it was just emerging as an item of gentleman's fashion. Right. Now, Wait, was the bowler hat an upper class thing then? I thought the top hat was no, more no. upper class and the bowler no, no, hat was more middle class. It wasn't. It was more middle class, yes, but yeah. he, he notes its emergence, right? Right. Now, James, of course, his art world, the museum world of Henry James, the title of a novel by Adeline, of a, a book by Adeline Tintner, mm. shows that he uses paintings also in all his novels, very subtly. But these are sort of off the map for me. I'm not into art of that kind. What I do love is music, and James, mm. alas, had no ear for music. <laughs> Once he had the opportunity to, to meet Richard Wagner, and he said, but I had nothing in common with him. Right. A waste of time, so he didn't meet him. He didn't meet him. And okay. another time he was invited to a concert, he was visiting Cambridge, and he didn't conceal his boredom. Um, uh, however, I discovered to my amazement uh, a scene in the Sacred Fount, uh, where the, all the characters are listening to a pianist. And uh -huh. it's quite a remarkable moment. It's bang in the middle of the novel. Um, so it's almost the only case uh, where James discusses music warmly. Uh -huh. um, now, um, perhaps I should talk about that. It's really, really, go ahead. Well, The Sacred Fount is a very extraordinary novel. It fascinated me when I read it as a very young uh, uh, boy. And it's, it's fascinating because it's a riddle, it's a detective novel uh, of the weirdest kind, and no solution is forthcoming. The, you never find out who did it. Yeah, the narrator is spending a weekend in a country house, and he notices that... Uh, that two people have been transformed and one of them has grown prematurely old, whereas his wife, whose name is Grace, Grace Brissenden, is blooming and blossoming. Mm -hmm. And another has become preternaturally young. A boring man called Gilbert Long has suddenly become brilliant. And he suspects that there is a law governing human relationships, whereas one, one of the couple is the sacred fount for the other. Okay. And the one who is the sacred fount is kind of vulture, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, leeching onto... Leached, yeah. leeched on by the, the, the beneficiary of the relationship. Right. And on the basis of this rather... Cannibal. <laughs> Cannibalized, yes. On the basis of this rather strange theory, he's trying to discover who is, is the woman who has been the sacred fount for Gilbert Long and who therefore would be depleted. Uh -huh. And he discovers that there is a lady, May Server, even her name Server suggests sacred Server, fount, yeah. who, um, who is depleted. She's a shadow of herself. She's become a, a weak, pathetic woman. And he's trying to discover, is she the sacred fount for Gilbert Long? Now, this is a quite ridiculous... Uh, uh, it's not that conventional detective story, no, let's put it that way. But the trouble with James is many of his plots are really outrageously ridiculous. Uh, uh -huh. If you look at George Eliot or Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy, everything is real. The people yeah. in those novels are so real, you, you can walk up and shake hands with them. Mm. And James had a rather envious tendency to dismiss those novels as loose, baggy monsters, mm. which was unfair, very unfair. Is that a phrase he actually used? He used that phrase of yeah. Tolstoy, but yeah. with more reference to war and peace. Right. But, you know, uh, 
I'm not sure he made any effort to to do justice to, to War and Peace structurally, but then I've never been able to read War and Peace, so I can't <laughs> comment. Um, in any case, um, this is the, 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 the MacGuffin, as Hitchcock would say, the MacGuffin, the plot device, which keeps the story going. Hmm. Now, Adeline Tintner has a very interesting article giving the solution, and the solution bears on the love that dare not speak its name, because uh -huh. the, the hidden couple is, that there are two hidden couples uh -huh. uh, uh, in, in, the, in the story. The two men, Gilbert and, and Guy, Guy Brissenden, uh, the, 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 the husband of Grace, and Grace and May Server. These are the two hidden couples. Right. It's very improbable, but as somebody said, when the impossible has been excluded, you have to accept the improbable. Sherlock Holmes, I believe, said was something it, was it, those was lines. It Sherlock Holmes. Yes. <laughs> well, it, well, James might have even read Sherlock Holmes and Could have might, have, indeed, uh, yeah. might yeah. have had that in mind when he devised his, his plot. Uh, in any case, th this is rather beside the point. The, the thing is, there's this musical scene in the middle of the novel, and I suspect that it's a clue to the nature of the novel. Because this is a very beautiful novel. It has wonderful scenes in the, the two and a half days he spends in the in the country house. Mm. And people are meeting and not meeting all the time, or not meeting. And it, when the, of course, because it's a detective story, the person that he that is avoided is the person that you should be, the person that the, say that Gilbert Long avoids a certain person, but then that's a sure sign that that person is the, the one you person we're looking for. Focusing so, on, yeah. So it's all terribly convoluted argumentation and cogitation going on in his mind. Right. And he has, he has um, conversations with Grace Brissenden where he shares his theory with her, but not revealing that he thinks she and her husband illustrate the theory. Ah. And she becomes his, his, his colleague. She has suggestions. And then she seems to have turned against him and, and trying to, to confuse him and to, to, to mislead him. And it becomes extremely complicated. But nonetheless, there's a kind of a ballet going on. The characters mm -hmm. are meeting and greeting and talking. And as I said the last time, in Henry James, when people talk, they're concealing rather than revealing their mm -hmm. true thoughts. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine. Uh, but this ballet is a kind of musical effect, you know, and it's very civilized because they're mm -hmm. all so sensitive. And yeah. So, on. so uh, now in the light of all that, in the middle of the novel, when, when the, the, the plot has thickened considerably, uh, we have this scene. I'll just read one or two sentences from it. When music in English society, as we know, is not an accompaniment to the voice, the voice can in general be counted on to assert its pleasant identity as an accompaniment to music. But at Newmarch we have been considerably schooled, and this evening in the room in which most of us had assembled, an interesting pianist who had given a concert the night before at the near county town and had been brought over during the day to dine and sleep, would scarce have felt in any sensitive fibre that he was not having his way with us. Basic, basic idea is people talk during music, but not at Newmarch. They've been schooled, and the pianist has got an ideal audience. Right. Now, th this scene of the music, the music becomes an emblem of civilization the perfection of civilization. Mm. And the characters, as they listen to the music, are conscious of their appearance, of how they look to each other. And the music is also giving them thoughts and ideas. They're all thinking over the events of the day. So this is a kind of a climax in the novel, all right. a moment of recollection, if you like. Yeah. I'll read on a little bit more. It may just possibly have been an hallucination of my own, but while we sat together after dinner in a dispersed circle, I could have worked it out that, as a company, we were considerably conscious of some experience, greater or smaller, from one of us to the other, that had prepared us for the player's spell. Some experience. Experience is a key, maybe not a key word, but a key concept in James. And the characters have been together in this highly civilized country house mm. and have been thinking about each other and have been relating to each other. And this is kind of an experience which has prepared them now to open up to the mystery of life as the pianist displays it in a different medium, a medium that has no thoughts or words. 
going back to your original theme of, well, kind of culture and society and his awareness of fashion and, and elites, mm -hmm. is this a kind of defining a little group that has the sensibility? Well, as, as, as I, 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 yes, uh, James, James is, is a cultural snob, of course. He would never refer to even a piece of slang that we might think not think is slang at all without putting it in quotation marks, scare right. quotes. He, he has some lower middle class people in his novels, yes, but the people that he values are the people with sensibility, like the telegraph girl in a story called In the Cage. Right. She's not the telegraph girl, but she's reading the aristocratic telegrams and she's deciphering how these people are relating to each other. And she's a hypersensitive perceptor, perceiver. And this makes her worthy of attention in James. Right, right. Um, so he's an intellectual snob as well. Uh, and in his an essay that he wrote about life after death, mm -hmm. he ventures the suggestion that truly refined consciousnesses will live on. Ah, but our worthy ones were oh, dull. Oh. <laughs> it's a new version of heaven and hell. You know? Right. <laughs> who, who, who are the chosen, the elect, the elect are those yeah, who are culturally yeah, who, refined. And who are intellectually aware and sensitive. And, and his own failure to appreciate music might have damned him in his... Did it, do you think he, it damned him in his own eyes? Or do you Not think he didn't really care about it? He that? didn't care about music at all. Right. It's quite amazing. There are many famous writers who have no feeling for music and yet write beautifully. Mm. Uh, Virginia Woolf, I imagine, because she, what she says about music in one of her novels, uh, in the last one, um, which is called Between the Acts, right. I think it shows somebody who knows nothing whatever about music. Uh -huh. Sigmund Freud hated music, didn't teach his children the piano, banned all musical instruments from his house. Uh, well, I wouldn't necessarily say he wrote very well. I he, did. He, he, he did. No, no, no. If you're even English, he wrote badly because he's badly translated. But he wrote beautifully in German. No, right? no. He's an artist of prose. There's no doubt about that. Oh, okay. And he's uh, also a culture vulture. He loves art and he loves uh, literature. More and than so you've always seen him more in terms of the content of what he wrote than the style in which he wrote it. Yeah. Right. Okay. But the, but the style. Corrected. The style is very beautiful. And in America now, they have the literary Freud. But unfortunately, it's based on English translations. American it doesn't work. American well. monolingualism is really a bit of a joke. You know? That doesn't make sense, does it? Really, no, but, but they never think. Well, I shouldn't be nagging. This is a bit off the point, but yeah, yeah. Um, James was not a monolinguist. Uh, he, he was very good at French, uh, Italian, German too. At least he could read German, I, I think. Um, right. And and not sure about Latin. Maybe he, qu he quotes Latin correctly here mm -hmm. and there. So right. um, now I've lost my thread. Anyway, these people have been pursuing their MacGuffin, uh, which is a ridiculous MacGuffin, if you like. Mm. Uh, it's of course much satirized. You know, um, uh, it's a novel about nothing, and of course that's the ideal for the true aesthete. You know, Flaubert wanted to write a novel about nothing. Mm. Um, but their, their movements are kind of a ballet, kind of a multi-layered ballet, if you like. And at this moment, when they're listening to the music, their whole activity is kind of raised to a higher level, and they become emblematic of civilization. Right. I'll read a bit more, you'll see. Felicitously scattered and grouped, we might, in almost any case, have had the air of looking for a message from it, from the, from the player's spell. Mm -hmm. Had the air of looking for a message from it, of an imagination to be flattered, nerves to be quieted, sensibilities to be soothed. The whole scene was as composed as if, as if there were scarce one of us would had a secret thirst for the infinite to be quenched. And it was the infinite that for the hour the distinguished foreigner poured out to us, causing us to roll in wonderful waves of sound, almost of colour, over our receptive attitudes and faces. So the infinite is presented by a foreigner, the only non-English person in the novel. Mm -hmm. And it's as if James is saying, you may think my novel is about nothing, but it has an infinite meaning. 
that it's about people being sensitive and thinking and responding and expanding their consciousness and refining their consciousness. Right. Um, is there a romantic element then in James? Because the, the romanticism is all about you know, the, the, the sensibility of the artist. Is, 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 it, is it part of that tradition or is it a continuation of that tradition or is it something quite separate? Oh, that's a very wide-ranging question. Big question, sorry. Yes. Or, no, 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 it's a very good question. If you think of Mozart's Così Fan Tutte, uh, uh -huh. it's a totally cynical opera about uh, two, two, two girls and two boys and an old uh, roué or what's the word in English, rake, makes a bet yeah. that if the two boys reappear in uh, disguise, each of the two girls will fall in love with the wrong boy. Uh -huh. It's a totally cynical opera, and yet it contains gloriously romantic music. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, this novel, The Sacred Fount, I would say is more on the cynical edge. It's kind of a game with, with uh, uh -huh. a game with psychology rather than... Uh, it, it's actually one of those novels that probably began as a short story and expanded to novel length. So it has the air of a, no, a, no, a novella rather than a novel. Mm -hmm. It's a very tidily self-contained piece. Romantic feeling, well, as you said, there's the artist is a romantic figure, and there's the, the romance in the sense of love stories. Um, there are there are love stories in James, uh, notoriously the portrait of a lady, and mm -hmm. then the wings of the dove. Um, but in both of them, the heroine is deceived by a false lover and misses uh, the people who might really have loved her. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, it, it's not. Um, it's, it's, in a sense, it's anti-romantic, you know. Uh -huh. um, uh, James and romanticism. I mean, of course, he did like some romantic writers. But again, is Balzac a romantic writer? Balzac has love stories, but mm. the presiding, <coughs> I think the presiding genius is anti-romantic. What I'm thinking of here is not so much romanticism in the sense of w w the typical idea of romantic love, but mm. the, the the sensibility of the romantic poet as the, the person who sort of has the elevated sensibility mm. and can convey it to, to the rest mm. of us poor mm. humanity who don't have mm. that kind of insight. Mm. Is James, in a sense, part of that? way of thinking, he's not quite part of that tradition, he, but he's, yes. he's... Well, he is, but he, he's, he's, he's kind of beyond it. I mean, he's closer to an artist like Flaubert, right? Uh -huh. Flaubert uses romantic material. Uh, right. Both of his two great novels have a love story at the heart of them. Right. Emma and, and you know, Emma Bovary and uh, <coughs> her, 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 her lovers and um, Frédéric Moreau, I think, is the hero of and the only real thing in his life is his love for this woman. I talked about it last week, and it's a novel that meant a lot to James. Mm -hmm. But um, in, in both of those cases, too, the love story is inserted in, in, in a kind of a, a perspective that, that tends towards disillusionment, right? I mean, th 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 there is a genuine passion of love in Emma and in Frederick. Mm -hmm. Uh, but but the, 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 the ultimate angle of the novel is not at all romantic. It's, it's, it's a critique of romanticism, basically. Right. Now, what, what James would have been fascinated by, of course, is the idea of the novel as a work of art. Mm. Uh, he read Madame Bovary as a boy when it came out in serial form in the Revue des Deux Mondes. Okay. And he witnessed the birth of the masterpiece, mm. but he... He, he writes. Um, he writes about Flaubert, whom he met. Whom he, I think he met him in, in, in Paris. But he writes about him very critically, hypercritically. He says the trouble with Emma Bovary is she's stupid, and if she were a refined heroine like mine, the novel would be much greater. Uh -huh. And the trouble with Frederick Moreau, he's the most unworthy vehicle of the novel. He's a non-entity. Right. So the same critique in two forms, really. And when James provides himself with a heroine, he ensures that the heroine, or the hero as the case may be, has a rich sensibility that can right. react to things, right. you know. 
So again, it's back to the idea that worthy people are, are those with with a, a refined sensibility, as as he perceived it. And and it's it's very much the world of art for art's sake and aestheticism. You know, I mean, James wrote for the Yellow Book. It's, he wrote some stories for the Yellow Book, which was a notorious uh, fin de siècle uh, magazine, mm. uh, magazine journal. Um, but James did not want to be associated with people like Oscar Wilde. He met Oscar Wilde in, in Washington when Oscar, when Oscar Wilde was on his American tour and he described him as a cad and an unclean <laughs> beast. Oh dear. <laughs> oh, so, uh, hard words indeed, yes, harsh words. Um, and he didn't have, a, in his novels, he never has an artist as the, as the hero or the protagonist. Mm. But he does have a string of short stories about writers and about painters, uh, where you can see exactly what he thinks about the, the, the writer's world, you know, mm. and mostly it's um, tales of disappointment, like nobody reads him, or he, right. he doesn't right. able to live because he has to write these, these books, and it's, it's a rather uh, ironic mm. and often very amusing picture of the fate of writers, you know. Right. I would say James wasn't a romantic in his attitude to art. He was more the totally dedicated writer who thought of his art as a kind of a sacred trust. Mm-hmm. You know, he said, "He said I have to cultivate my genius." His genius was kind of a, a burden imposed on him, and he said, "The deepest reality of my life has been loneliness," which is not solved by the deep counterminings of art. You know, right. so he was a total, um, totally devoted to this uh, mammoth task. He's at, the, he's at the top of his game, and yeah. it's lonely at the top. Absolutely. Right. I mean, you know, Graham Greene calls him the Shakespeare of the novel, yeah. and it seems an exaggeration. But it's quite amazing that the more we have read and reread James for the last century, the more he has grown all the in time. Stature. Yeah. He's grown in yeah. stature. You know? Going back to the idea of the kind of inconclusiveness, the fact that you, the, 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 the ending doesn't matter, the outcome doesn't it, it, It's something that, you know, like, like turning up the screw, you know, you never quite know who's, you know, mm-hmm. who's, who, mm-hmm. which, which way around do we read that story? You can mirror it totally. Yes. Yes. Is, it, is that part of it, that uh, it's the telling, not the, if you want answers, mm-hmm. then your, yeah. your sensibility is not refined enough to be, <laughs> to, be, right. to be on my level, as it were. Right. It's true that pretty much all his novels the ones that the one, one thinks of immediately, they do end on a note of ambiguity. Right? Mm-hmm. And this is part of the complexity of, of the story, you know, that you're yeah. never quite sure. As I think I said the last time, the heroine, he has a, a series of heroines with a name, and people connect that with this, this woman that he had a certain romantic attachment to, his cousin Minnie Temple, mm-hmm. when he was young. There is, there is a, let me think of their names, there is, Millie Thiel in The Wings of the Dove, there's Marie the Vionnet in, in The Ambassadors, there's Maisie in What Maisie Knew, Maisie's mm-hmm. a child, she's growing in sensibility, she knows more than the adults around her because she's more mm-hmm. considerate and perceptive and so on. Uh, there's, um, there's a string of them, Maeve Verver, isn't it, in, in, the, in the Golden Bowl? No, Maggie Verver. Um, so Maggie, these are not incident, these are not accidents that, that the heroines have an M in their name, you know. Yeah, yeah. And these are later heroines, you know. So um, uh, they come across as saintly people, you know, angelic people, the wings mm-hmm. of the dove. Militil spreads her protective wings like a dove. That's mm-hmm. one of the associations of the title. But then you say, um, we must examine their motives more closely. Huh. How do they allow themselves to be deceived by their, by their erring husbands or their exploitative lovers? Uh, and are they not themselves then manipulating things as they turn the tables? Mm. You know, and that's mm. very true of the Golden Bowl, which it's um, it's a hyper snobby novel because the characters are all princes, and the first half of the novel is called the Prince, 
she is the Italian that Maggie and her father have more or less bought to be her husband. Mm. And the first half of the novel is told from his point of view, along with her father's point of view. And we see her from the outside, the heroine. Right. The second point, the second half of the novel is the princess, Maggie Verver. And it begins a most elaborate chapter where she realizes to her horror that her husband is having an affair with her best friend, Charlotte. And for the rest of the, of the novel, she is manipulating the situation to get Charlotte out of the way by marrying her to her father, by marrying Charlotte to Maggie's father and sending them off to America, which in this novel is considered a fate worse than death. <laughs> and at the end, she has captured her husband and they, they end up by, he's kissing her. But you kind of feel that the image of the golden bowl pervades the novel. You kind of feel there is still a crack in that golden bowl. Mm. She has reconstituted beautifully, reconstituted it beautifully by dint of deception and manipulation. You know? Right. So the ambiguity, the essential mm -hmm. ambi ambiguity, yeah. I think, I'm, yeah. more and more I think about it, ambiguity is essential to great literature, really. That yeah. The people who actually just come out and say it, yeah. well, that's it, it's said, it's done, it's over. The people who kind of open up all the implications mm, yes. and let you delve into the implications, yes. that's where the, the in the end, the, the other people whose reputations grow, like Shakespeare himself. Yeah. Well, um, Shakespeare's plays are very ambiguous, but the greatest ones are the most ambiguous. So yeah, Hamlet, Hamlet exactly. is extreme ambiguity from yeah. beginning to end. It's yeah. a wonderful play. Um, King Lear is deeply ambiguous because does evil triumph or good? How ambiguous can you get? Yeah. Macbeth and Othello are not so ambiguous. Well, we don't know what yeah. Macbeth originally might have been, in particular Macbeth, because it, mm -hmm. it, we only have a very reduced script. I mean, that, we don't. I'm pretty sure that that must have been cut. Ah, that's very interesting. That, that, that you know, that confirms my impression that it's a shrunken kind of. Play. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's. I think that's what critics feel, uh, the, 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 and I'm not sure what the evidence for it is, but that's. That's my understanding, that it's not the, we're not getting the complete thing. We're getting something that's had bits snipped out here and it sort of focuses more on the action and there are probably more... Ref well, I don't know if it's... If, but I suspect that there are more reflective, reflective parts because yes. really the, the Macbeth that we get has no introspection and no, or very little. Yeah, and he, well, he, he's simply, oh, yeah, I'm going to be king. Well, I'm going to no, go no, and kill the, the king then. No, 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 the, 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 great, the, great, the great scenes are scenes of reflection, but there are very few of them. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. Duncan is dead after life's weary something, he sleeps well, you know, or mm. tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and so on. Yeah, we get these the famous passages, but they're very short and yeah. they leave you unsatisfied. You feel you haven't really got to know Macbeth at all no. as a person. The, the, he's not, he, we don't, he doesn't have an interior mm. identity, mm. Mm. Not, a, not in the way that Hamlet, like, oh, mm. Hamlet's the opposite right. extreme. Right? Right. We've got so much right. philosophizing going on coming from Hamlet that... Right. But uh, we sort of kind of get on with it, mate. You know. But uh, well, one of the, one of the things that show the snobbery of James to me is that in his novels, the main characters get tremendous attention, but he also has minor characters which he feels are necessary to the plot, and he calls them ficelle, ficelle, which means strings. Yeah, a ficelle. And he um, uh, there's a Henrietta Stackpole, with a horrible name, in. Um, in the portrait of a lady, she's a kind of companion to the heroine Isabel, and she's a good, well-meaning American person who's sort of boring. And James mm. treats her; he does her, you know, like doing a subject. Uh, somebody complimented him in one of his novels that he was able to do a Cockney girl in, mm. in uh, the Princess Casamassima. There's a girl called Millicent, and sh she is very well done as a Cockney girl. But you kind of feel. It's almost patronising he is. Created this character. And Dickens might create characters like that, but in Dickens they're more alive in a sense because Dickens has more sympathy and more more, yeah. de more democracy, if you like. Dickens yeah. treats everybody equally, you know? I think Dickens' characters are amazing. His yeah. plots are not necessarily all that good, yeah. but his characters, I mean, look at Oliver yeah. Twist. I mean, what, what a wonderful set of characters. A terrible plot, but a wonderful set of characters. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I, that's what I find attractive mm -hmm. about Dickens, really, yeah. is that he creates these very, very memorable mm -hmm. characters. Mm -hmm. I don't quite get the same feeling from James, that no. his characters are, are more like vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, 
not that I'm a great James expert or anything, mm. but but to me the characters come across yeah. more as kind of vehicles for something else. Yes, I think you're right. And um, uh, another of these is Susan Stringham. Even her name is Stringham. You know? And she's she, Stringham. <laughs> she is the she is the, the the companion of of Millie in the Wings of the Dove. In fact, the Wings of the Dove is a rewriting of the portrait of a lady. Yeah. yeah. And th- this is an aspect of James that is it's, it's immense and. It's the intertextuality that James, as again Adeline Tintner in her book, The Book World of Henry James, shows that many of James's famous stories are rewritings of classic novels. For example, Washington Square rewrites Balzac's Eugénie Grandet. Mm. I have theories about those. I think The Ambassadors rewrites Flaubert's Les Ducasting Sentimental. And he's doing this covertly. He's doing it covertly. And the clue that Flaubert is the person he's he's rewriting he led you guys in in um, the ambassadors is that it mentions many French writers but not Flaubert. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And it's a giveaway. The, there's a technique that's common to the two novels: reference to time mm-hmm. are multiplied, and they're multiplied with an effect of giving you a sense of panic. Mm-hmm. In Les Ducasse Sentimental, the two young men come to Paris with great ambitions, and then you start noticing. He, he arranged to meet her on the following Thursday. She didn't turn up, but on the Friday after that, they spent an hour, and you have all these references to time, which is eating them away. Right. Anyway, 20 years passed, it, 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 something like that. The, a brief sentence like that opened up a huge abyss in the novel, uh-huh. and Marcel Proust uh, was very fascinated by that that, that moment. You know, mm-hmm. he, 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 it says he voyaged... He knew the boredom of steamboats, the cold awakenings under a tent... The bitterness of interrupted sympathies, beautiful act. He returned, 20 years past. Uh, you know, in fact, his life is nothing, right. and he's been eaten away by time, you know, uh, which of course is Proust's theme as well. The, right, the, right. The, the, the very title of his novel, The Search of Lost. So he's, a, he's, he's, in a sense, ripping his plots off from other people. Yes, but he's, 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 he's not ripping the plots off, he's improving, as he thinks, uh-huh. on the original. So it's a kind of a work of literary criticism as well. He's sort of saying, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, if I were Flaubert, this but is. But he's not doing. He's not mm-hmm. open. He's not doing it openly. He's no. he's hiding it away. He That's doesn't right. want his reader to know that, That's right. that, that he's it doing. He keeps that. completely mum. He never gives a hint. Yeah, and it's only the critics kind of discover it. You know? But but in 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 the ambassadors too, these references to time punctuate the whole novel. Mm-hmm. And there's one line where he's, the hero remembers a Spanish clock with the inscription. Again, it's one of James's pieces of Latin. Uh, Omnia vulnerant, ultima necat. They all wound the last kills. The last? The last kills. Oh, every second necat, wounds yes, the, yes, the last right, kills. Right. They all wound. Kills the last kills. So every space. second yeah. wounds us and the last one and kills then, you us. Know, right. uh, it's a bit like that T-shirt that says, life yeah. sucks and then you die, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, and you know, in... in uh, in Flaubert's novel, the two young men uh, must be about 50 by the time the novel ends, if there's a sleep of 20 years. Whereas in James's novel, the hero is 55, mm. and he's got less time, but he's going to begin to live. And one of the famous lines of the novel is, live all you can, it's a mistake not to. Very basic advice given by uh, one character in the novel to another. But it's part of the... You know, it's like uh, Marvel, you know, screw, what is a screw hole or something into a bowl? Though we cannot stop time, yet we can make him run. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, roll our all our strength and all our sweetness up into one bowl. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. 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 We cannot make our sun stand still, yet we will make him run. That's right, that's right. Great, great great point. That's the spirit, that's the spirit of the ambassadors. It's a yeah. novel I disliked and found very boring until I reached the age of the protagonist, whose name is Strether, and I suddenly began to appreciate, appreciate this novel <laughs> anew, you know. Uh, 